Hello everyone, I'm John and I'm here to talk about international larking and why I believe you should do it. Um, who am I? So I'm British, uh, I've been a larper for more than 30 years. I uh, run a company that produces larps and offers con consultancy on larping, um, as well as more general project management. I've been running LARPs for 28 years um, and have, for the last four, been active on the international scene, both as a contributor, a writer and a participant. So, what is international LARP? This is, as it says, a list of very obvious things, or things that might appear obvious, at least on the surface. Um, it's international. It's all over the place. Um, there are... I've got a little map here. Those are the events that I've attended in the last 12 months. Um, spanning Poland, Scandinavia, Britain, Spain, Italy. Uh, I've been very lucky to be able to travel and LARP with a lot of different people in a lot of different countries. Generally, they're played in English. This is incredibly convenient for me. Uh, less convenient for some of you, but Sorry. No problem. Uh, but yes, one of the features of international LARP is that generally the common language is English. Um, but because they're international, your language skills are not um, a topic of discussion. You come, you, you put in the effort to role play with people. It doesn't matter if your English is not the best. No one is going to be judging you on it. Um, some games include language difference as a design element. So there's a game, Harem Sans Sat, which was written by uh, a very lovely French lady. And in that, the uh, French speaking side of it and the English speaking side of it are used to distinguish between the two different parts of the game, the, the Ottomans and the internationals. Um, aimed at international LARPers. Again, stating the obvious it seems, but it's a deliberate design choice. Um, international LARP is not just a game that is run locally that is then run for international LARPers. It's a game that deliberately makes design choices to include people from other countries and from other play styles. Um, the best games use that um, use those differences and that collaboration to try and enhance the game experience for everyone. And it's often high budget in destination locations. Uh, international LARP tends to be an opportunity for local LARP scenes to showcase themselves, to try and spread the word of what they do particularly well or the, the lovely places that they have and they use it as a showcase for their, their local scene. So, where, where can you go with this? So that's uh, not the Wild West, um, but it is a Wild West town in southern Spain where a Spanish company ran a Westworld LARP. Um, this, is, this was built originally as a film set. So the sort of 360 degree illusion was really strong. That is a prison in Leicestershire in, in the UK. Uh, we played a game called Quota there, which I will reference a few times, uh, which was about um, asylum seekers and refugees um, set in the near future post our brilliant Brexit idea where the English economy has tanked and lots of English people are trying to make it into Wales for a better life. And there's only a set number who are allowed, hence the quota. And it was held in an actual prison. Some of you might recognise that. Um, that's Elsinore Castle. Um, the setting that Shakespeare chose for Hamlet and the setting for Inside Hamlet. 
the Danish game in which plays out the last acts of Hamlet and in which you're a participant within the very famous play. A number of you will recognise that as well. That's uh, Chohar Castle in Poland, where College of Wizardry is held. Um, I like to think that College of Wizardry is an immensely popular Danish-run game based loosely around the Harry Potter IP, um, but separate from it now. And the castle is such an amazing venue. It, it's... Uh, people talk about it almost like an additional character in the, in the game. It's got its own personality. It's not <laughs> It's not Marlin. And that is La Grasse, which is a tall ship, a replica of a Czech tall ship that sailed during the golden age of sail across the Atlantic and privateered its way around the Caribbean and I was lucky enough to have a spot as a pirate on board that ship earlier this year as we sailed around Elba uh, off the Italian coast um, during the game Raven Crew run by Terra Spezzate. And these are incredible experiences. I have long harboured a desire to helm a tall ship. That I grew up sailing off the coast of, of England and this game, um, I spent 12 hours as the solo helmsman uh, on board that incredible ship. And it was a life ambition. And there was a lot. And it was brilliant. So, what type of games can I play? Dark, adult-themed Nordic games. These are the ones that get quite a lot of attention because they become stories that people tell at events like this. I would classify Inside Hamlet in this. Um, the, the other game that particip participation design do, uh, Baphomet, which is about um, cultists worshipping demons. It, definitely a dark, adult-themed Nordic game. But these are not, by any stretch of the imagination, the only things. Franchise-based games, these are becoming more and more prevalent. Battlestar Galactica games, Harry Potter-style games, Westworld games, all sorts of games are based on franchises. These have an amazing benefit that they attract a lot of new players. And new players are some of the most exciting players to, to roleplay with. Some of the most exciting LARP experiences I've had are with brand new players and franchise based games are brilliant at pulling them in because they're easy to understand that there's an immediate connection to the IP. Uh, period games. Uh, there's a lot of games running around history and particularly social history. Um, so Suffragette is, is a game that's happening in next month I believe. Uh, which is obviously based around women's emancipation. Um, Harem Somsat, which I've already mentioned, is about the last days of the harem in the Ottoman Empire. Um, yeah, there's some crossover between these two as well in the form of Fairweather Manor, which is um, not a Downton Abbey lark, in the same way that College of Wizardry is not a Harry Potter lark. Fantasy games. These tend to get a bit overlooked by the international community because everybody's very busy doing dark adult team Nordic games and sitting in their immersion closet weeping quietly to themselves and they forget that there is a thriving international community doing fantasy games. The likes of uh, Conquest in Germany, uh, which is approaching 10,000 participants in a massive fantasy town and battlefields, uh, Empire in the UK makes provision for international players in that there are foreign nations and each one of them allows you to play with your own native language as a foreigner, if you like, to, to the Empire. Political games. Um, there's a, a game that's uh, not all love. The Spanish company are running called No Middle Ground 
which is about um, political negotiation and sort of a, a head-on clash of player versus player political aims. Uh, there was a game run last year in the European Parliament. Um, it was a vampire game, believe it or not, about vampires wielding political influence within the EU. And they had some MEPs playing some MEPs. So the procedural sides of it were absolutely bang on, and yet there were a lot of LARPers sort of looming behind them. Going, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> but these aren't all of them. And uh, frankly, they're an arbitrary selection of, of terms that I came up with. Eurovision LARP. <laughs> Uh, teams of people competing in the Eurovision competition, uh, Eurovision Song Competition. Vintage Hollywood Politics, the game on location, which is where uh, the whole sort of set up for a Hollywood movie are waiting for their director and you know he's never going to turn up. Um, Post-apocalyptic, there's a ton of the vendors out there that have got post-apocalyptic gear that they're selling. There's some props from Old Town which is like a, a week and a half long, two week Polish LARP stroke festival stroke sort of hybrid thing, which uh, includes bands and actual post-apocalyptic vehicles and all sorts. Uh, Road Trip ran a tour, a, a touring band across uh, America, down Route 66, and the players actually played gigs. They actually became a band for the duration. And there was this whole very interesting, uh, what, how does a LARP interact with the public? Because they were performing to people that didn't know they were LARPing. Because they were an actual band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, witches in a World War II internment camp in Sweden. Uh, the Witches of Astrid Farm, which is a, a brilliant LARP uh, written by Karin Edman uh, and uh, involves uh, a lot of sort of themes of oppression and identity and women's emancipation. 1920s Gangs in the English Midlands, or the Not the Peaky Blinders LARP. Um, again, sort of based off of a franchise. Uh, it's called Gangs of Birmingham. It's happening next year. And they've got... We, I live very, very close to the venue for this, which is a living history museum. Um, and it's all period, so it, it's proper 360-degree immersion. Um, and being on board a ship with Dracula in the shore and certain knowledge that you aren't going to survive LARP. Uh, the Last Voyage of the Demeter, a uh, game that I've wanted to play for years. Another shipboard LARP. Uh, it's set during the, uh, the part of the Dracula novel where they're taking Dracula to Whitby on a ship. And the Demeter arrives at Whitby and there's no one alive. So we all know what's going to happen. Right. A brief word on blockbuster LARPs. So, not all international LARPs are blockbuster LARPs. Not all blockbuster LARPs are necessarily international LARPs, but generally they tend to be. Um, the definition that has been uh, created for blockbuster LARPs runs on these six different areas. So, location. In order for it to be considered a blockbuster LARP, it has to have a destination location. So, Choha or Elsinore or what have you. Fiction. It is argued that blockbuster LARPs work off an existing IP. So, uh, Baphomet, for instance, or Cult or what have you. They're not considered blockbuster LARPs by this definition because they don't run off an existing IP. College of Wizardry runs loosely next to Harry Potter, and so it is. Audience, very much aimed at first-time LARPers, very much aimed at broadening the audience from traditional LARP audiences and out to, um, out to sort of new areas. So the appeal of Harry Potter is beyond just um, LARPers. It, it, it appeals across a very broad section of uh, geekery. And so Blockbuster Lots tried to leverage that to bring in new, new people. Economy. 
The argument has been made that it is not a blockbuster lot unless the tickets cost at least 200 euros. Um, the aim is for high production value um, and an exclusivity that only comes from a high price. So the idea is to make this a destination experience, if you like. So people talk about the fact they went to Inside Hamlet uh, as being this massive thing that they did. Um, the format, uh, the, there are suggestions that Blockbuster Larp should follow a very specific format. Um, there was a, a quite famous paper that was written about this uh, entitled How to Write a Blockbuster Larp. Uh, and it involves a very specific intro section, then the meat of the game, and then a final big showpiece. And rules. Rules light is a prerequisite for a blockbuster LARP. Um, I tell you this because a lot of LARPs market themselves as blockbuster LARPs, and this is the this is what they mean by that. Yeah, it's an elephant. It's a big red and gold elephant. And it's in our international lot room. Price. So, international LARPing is not cheap. I can't stand here and pretend that it is. I can't stand here and tell you that everybody can afford to do it. I wish they could. But it's not. I mean, it's not only do you have the entry price of, to the LARP, which obviously, as we've already established, if it's a blockbuster LARP, is deliberately held high in order to generate a feeling of exclusivity and of destination. Uh, but also, there are tons of hidden costs. So your airfare, your food, your costume, because blockbuster LARPs, if you're LARPing in a castle or on board a tall ship, you need to look like you belong in the castle or on board the tall ship. I can't turn up in my jeans and t-shirt and go, ah, I'm a pirate. <laughs> well, I can, but nobody else is going to be doing that, and I'm going to feel terrible for doing it. So, costume, and believe me, costume costs can accelerate beyond all belief. Um, also, you end up travelling to see the friends you're going to make. I mean, it's not a downside. I'm here. But it, it costs. The interna journeying into international LARPing is, is not a cheap thing to do. But treat it like a holiday. Treat it as though you are going away for a week to sit on a beach. And then it starts to look less expensive. I mean, it's still expensive, obviously, because holidays aren't cheap. But it's a, it's a once a year thing. Maybe twice if you're lucky. And there is help. Um, there are a number of schemes, and some of them run by the LARPs themselves, some of them run by independent organisations, which can help you with the ticket price of the LARP, and can help you with some of the costs. So uh, many LARPs run a kind of series of uh, a patronage scheme where one player can pay 100 euros more if they can afford it and someone else can get 100 euros off the ticket price. It doesn't make it cheap, but it makes it more affordable. Uh, Raven Crew, the pirate LARP, they ran um, the shipboard LARP where we all got to pirate around on this wonderful ship, but they also ran a shore LARP where they built a pirate village on a beach in Italy and there was a very political game going on there and there were English redcoats and there were pirate, like former <coughs> pirate barons and they were all vying for control of the town and tickets for that started at 50 euros. Um, still not nothing, but more affordable. Um, and having spoken to many of the players who played that sure lot, they did not feel at all like they were getting a diminished experience. 
So, why international LARP? Why not local LARP? New locations. So that is the castle in which they run Pharaoh Fer in the Manor. Um, we looked at running a game that was based loosely on Downton Abbey. We looked at some of the places in the UK that we had that looked a little bit like this if you squinted. Um, that place has 256 rooms. We were able to find a venue that had uh, enough room for 80 people. Uh, that venue in the UK was going to cost us £80,000 for a weekend. So that's £1,000 each just for the location. It's not possible. You can't do it. No one will pay more than £1,000 for a lot in the UK. Certainly not 80 people. Um, but you can do it in Poland. And the only way you're going to get that experience is if you travel for it. New styles of play. Um, because these games are not run by your local game runners, then they're bringing new ideas in. They're bringing new ways of playing. Um, the Czech um, content LARP uh, philosophy is all about uh, organizer-generated content. And uh, a company called Rolling run Legion and Delabet. Uh, and those games are all about character interaction that's been kind of almost scripted by the, by the authors. That gives you a very different experience to, say, Inside Hamlet, where you're given a setup and left to run with it, or College of Wizardry, where it's just a complete sandbox. Um, experiencing new styles of play is really useful. New people. I mean, there's... This, for me, is the most compelling reason to internationally LARP, because the international LARP community is so diverse. It's full of people from different cultures, from different places, who have got different ideas about what LARP means to them. And because they have taken the effort, because they have made the effort to travel to LARP, they are all invested in having the best time they possibly can. And so you get groups of players who become your friends. And you, all of a sudden you've got friends all over the place and you end up being invited to come and talk in Finland at a, at a convention that you never thought you would. I mean, it, five years ago, coming to Helsinki to talk to you lot about international law would have been so far away. Uh, but it's because of the people. But international LARP is also good for your local scene. Um, those new styles, there's always something you can take from them to make your games better. There's always something, whether it be playing or whether it be organising or whether it be writing content for LARPs, there's always something you can bring from your experiences abroad into your local scene. The experience of many, what do I mean by that? I mean that the chances are when your local scene encounters an issue or a problem or a new challenge, the chances are that some of your international colleagues have probably already seen that somewhere. And they can offer how they dealt with it. Um, new players. It's a massive one. Uh, just as you are welcomed into the international community, so you can welcome the international community into your area. I know when I was researching this, I was looking for international Finnish LARPs. And the only recent one that I could really find was Freak Show. Um, I know that there's a Dysius coming up next year, which is aiming to be an international game. I'm hoping to be there. Um, but bringing f new and interesting people into your own games can help your scene grow and expand. It also drives improvements. Um, competition is, is often seen as a, a bit of a 
bit of a problem, uh, but it shouldn't be. Because your LARP is now competing for players with international LARPs. Your LARP is now competing for the time from those players. And that should be used to motivate you to improve your LARPs, make them better so that you get these new players from abroad and you get these new ideas. And it builds the hobby as a whole. The, the idea of community um, is one that we talked about last night in, in the panel and building an international community. It helps the hobby get better because we have shared experience, because we have shared best practice. But it also, and this, this can sound really soppy, it also helps us as people get better. Because contact with other human beings with different ideas and different backgrounds from yourself is a good thing. It helps you. It helps you learn. So, hopefully, I've convinced you. What next? How do you found it, find out about this stuff? Because it's not straightforward, <laughs> necessarily. There are a number of places that you can get help. So there's LARP Europe, the Facebook group, which tends to be um, full of adverts for different LARPs. Um, it tends to avoid much of the toxicity, toxicity that some, can sometimes build up around online communities. Um, and so it's, it's definitely a group worth joining if you're interested in international LARP. In, the snappily named Info on English Speaking Blockbuster LARPs. It does pretty much what it says. Anyone who considers their LARP to be a blockbuster LARP can post up an advert there. LARPers BFF, um, so another Facebook group that is not specifically designed for advertising. It's not somewhere you can go necessarily to see adverts, but it is somewhere that you will hear about LARPs. It's sometimes, BFF is supposed to be best friends forever, and it's supposed to be a moderated environment where everybody's very nice to one another. A lot of the time it is that, sometimes it is not that. It's an online community. But it is a good place to hear about international LARP work that's upcoming. And the one that I use most, Friends Who LARP. Friends Who Go to International LARP. Now Friends Who, in, who Run International LARPs. Uh, they'll talk to me, they'll send me a PM to say, oh, John, we've got this LARP coming up, what do you reckon? And I will then try and share it on my Facebook because I know that I've got a number of friends who are interested in going to these things and don't necessarily get to hear about them. Events. Are good, these are good places to find out about new LARPs. Uh, Knutepunkt is the biggest LARP convention in the world, I guess. Um, happens February in either Denmark, Norway, Sweden or Finland. Um, it rotates around each year. Uh, it's full of panels and discussions, and workshops and short LARPs, and it's totally worth a visit if you get a chance. Um, it is also where many of the uh, international LARP community go to promote their events. The smoke, I, I have to, I'm contractually obliged to promote the smoke. Uh, it's a UK based weekend. Uh, held at the end of January in London, uh, where we have a series of small three or four hour LARPs that you can come and play. Um, and then in the evenings, there's a social get together. It's like a mini kind of convention. Well worth attending it for the games alone, but it's also a brilliant place to get to know more of the international community. Those LARPs are run not just by British LARP rides, but by international ones as well. And it would be also a bit rude not to mention RoboCon. <laughs> uh, so there I am. I'm mentioning it. Uh, it's brilliant. I'm really enjoying myself so far. And getting to talk to people who are LARPers in Finland and considering coming onto the international scene or who are already on it, uh, learning a great deal about Finnish LARP culture that I didn't know before. Then there are some companies to keep an eye out for. 
these are the the ones that off the top of my head came up as the big players in international law. Uh, DLS, Joe Batlock Studios, the people who run College of Wizardry, Fairweather Manor, Gangs of Birmingham, uh, Convention of Thorns, uh, a, a lot of the really big uh, international LARPs are DLS LARPs. Um, they're essentially, along with the people that ran Monitor Celestra, I'd say they were probably the progenitors of the idea of a blockbuster LARP. Um, Rowling, Czech company run Legion um, and Della Bet, um, and I think they ran a dance LARP as well, uh, based around dancing. Um, they are very different in their approach. As I mentioned earlier on, the, the content LARP approach to it involves a lot of pre-generated characters and pre-generated relationships, and even pre-generated events during the LARP. At this point, you will duel this person, and the outcome will be this. Um, and it's interesting, because it's, it's designed to generate more story. Uh, Terra Spezzate. Italian LARP company uh, ran Black Friday, uh, which was a kind of modern day mystery LARP. Um, Icarus, which was based on the TV series and books, The Expanse. Uh, they ran that down the mine in Italy. Um, uh, they ran Atlantis, uh, and also they ran the Raven Crew. Uh, they believe in the Southern Way which is a, a LARP uh, approach that says uh, we don't care for safety. Kind of. um, they, they, value, um, they value their illusion and their experience over uh, the off-game mechanisms for ensuring their sa the safety of their participants and in exchange expect their participants to act like adults. It, it's a different way that is worlds away from the way that many Nordic uh, LARP companies approach things, but it does make for a very interesting interesting game. We were told, yeah, you're more than welcome to climb up to the crow's nest, uh, but if you fall off, then you fall off. Uh, we've got harnesses, you can use them if you want. I didn't, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I chose not to. I, I clung onto the helm like a, a crazy man. Mm. Broken Dreams, Avalon and Carcosa Freelance. I must these three together in a terrible disservice to some very good friends of mine. Uh, they are three different organisations, but there's a lot of crossover in the games that they run. Uh, they're British companies. Broken Dreams are doing some of the most exciting and interesting UK LARPs, in my opinion. We, we had a, a series of LARPs called Twilight Theatre, which were held in a theatre in London. And the idea was that we were fairies from the Fae Realm, from different courts within the Fae Realm, using performance art to influence the politics of the UK and beyond. Um, uh, no rules, no real kind of idea what we were getting into when we arrived, and they were fantastic. Uh, but they also run Tenement 67, which is a cyberpunk LARP. They run um, uh, Forsaken, which is a post-apocalyptic heaven-hell war kind of strange um, end-of-the-world game. Uh, in conjunction with Avalon, they ran um, The Quota, which was the refugee game I was talking about earlier on. Avalon themselves are running Avalon, which is the spin-off LARP from College of Wizardry. Um, Carcosa Freelance, again, very old friends of mine. Uh, they ran a game called Sisyphus earlier in the year, uh, which was... Uh, another shipboard LARP, um, and it was a 19... It began in the 1980s, but then it became a trans-dimensional, time-travelling mystery game. Uh, but it was fabulous, and it was, it was deliberately designed to encourage international participation. 
we would love more of you to come to the UK. The international scene in the UK is relatively nascent at the moment uh, because for a long time we were like, well, we printed a lot, so we know how to do it. I mean, what can we learn from that lot? Uh, quite a lot, it turns out. Uh, not only LARPs, a uh, Spanish company, uh, they ran Conscience, they're running No Middle Ground. Uh, they ran a game that was um, about retirees in an old people's home, um, which uh, by all reports was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, they're doing, they, they too are kind of proponents of a slightly modified southern way. That there's a very definite north-south divide in Europe between the way that we, we run our LARPs. And participation design. Um, inside Hamlet and Baphomet, a Danish company, they're uh, very much into their adult-themed, dark, kind of Nordic-style LARP. Um, and they do it incredibly well. So... Oops, there were some credits, and then there's some thanks. Um, so thank you to all of you for for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, something uh, comes to mind, thinking of the sort of contrast between uh, LARPing culture in, for example, Finland as opposed to North America. Uh, in Finland, I found that LARPing is kind of somewhat based on um, improvisational theater. There's a game master who writes all the characters and in uh, North America, then you have players who write their own characters and so on. So I was wondering if, like, which approach is used in the sort of international world community in Europe? Or is it a mixture of both? Does it depend on who you're dealing with? Okay, so it says here I've got to repeat the questions uh, if you don't have a microphone. So the question was, um, the, with differing styles of character creation, some where the, the characters and I guess to an extent the plot are created by the organisers and some where the characters are left to the individuals to create uh, and which is most prevalent or which is the, the, the prevailing design in, in international art. And the answer was in the question to a degree, it, it's a complete mix. Um, there are the, the the content style of LARP it is very much um, born out of that kind of the GM has written you a character and here is your background and here are the people that you know and this is what you know about them and here are your secrets and at this point we would like this to happen this is a sort of set piece that we're expecting you to participate in um, and then you have something like College of Wizardry which is a sandbox. And if you are, they will happily write you a character, or in fact give you one of their pre-written characters and let you make of it what, what you will. But you're free to change whatever you want. There are no organiser arranged plot lines or events. It's Everything is generated by the players of that particular run. Now, for College of Wizardry, what that does for them is it makes it almost infinitely replayable because uh, when Kaiser and I decide we're going to run a plot at College of Wizardry involving a demon in the walls and we're going to set two sets of students against one another, we do that. That will never happen again. That was just that run. The next run, something else is going to happen that's crazy. Um, so the, the answer to your question is that there are both styles and getting to experience that difference is one of the things that I love most about international art. I think it's brilliant. Uh, what's your take on international art that somehow utilise features based on that specific country? For example, I imagine the border has very much to do with how it's being rooted in Britain. And then there's this game, Norwegian game called 942, that you also the uh, World War II history in uh, Norway. So, does that make for a good international world? What are the considerations of 
being based on specifically one. Okay, so again, to repeat the question for the benefit of if it's being recorded, I don't know if it is, but um, uh, the question was, what are the what are my feelings on using uh, specific features of countries and specific national issues in international law, and whether that makes for a good game or not? I, I come back on that to the idea that experiencing culture and new communication with people of different cultures is a good thing and helps us to, to improve as people. Um, it's important for organisers not to assume knowledge in those situations. Um, so as an English person playing the quota, I have a much clearer idea of what Brexit means to the English than perhaps one of our Swedish or Finnish or uh, Danish co-players did. But they, through the promotional material, through the background information and through the game itself, the organisers went out of their way to communicate that cultural and regional feel. Um, I mean, we had but as, as inmates in the game, we had uh, compulsory Welsh lessons. Um, now, Welsh is uh, unintelligible to me, as I suspect it is to most of you. Um, and yet that formed a part of our characters education and was a really interesting and clever way to communicate the cultural and social routing of the game. Um, so, yes, I think it's a great thing because I want to learn about your cultures. I want to learn about your history. I find that interesting. But I want you to make provision for me as someone who is ignorant of that to be able to come into those situations and not feel like I'm not part of the club. I know we talked about this yesterday, but uh, I'd like to address, uh, or I would like you to address uh, the uh, negative impact international working can have on the local community. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> So, uh, if, yeah, I'm going to keep this really quick because there's one more question and yes. I'm running out of time. Um, I, if I had a pound for every time I've been told I was ruining UK law by bringing in all these terrible continental practices, then I would be uh, a very rich man. Um, for those that are not a part of it, it is the other, it, especially when people come back and start encouraging change. Um, We've been doing this since 1982. Don't tell us, don't presume to tell us how we should be laughing. Um, yes, yeah, don't, don't come around here with your A. For anyone that doesn't know, there's an ongoing and deep-seated rift in our community in the UK about whether it should be LRP or LARP. And if I, again, hours of argument over that one little A. Um, so yes, it can be it can be damaging if it's not handled correctly. But the way that I try to approach it is uh, through collaboration rather than lecturing. Um, try and bring them along with you on, in making changes to your local community rather than telling them that they must do things differently. Yeah, I, I kind of meant like on the Polish, like we go there oh, to oh, okay. the Polish can't afford to go to the. Yes, okay. Um, so, yes, I would love to see more LARP um, companies have regard for the local communities into which they go. Um, I think Joba could be doing a lot more for the Polish LARP scene because most Polish LARPers can't afford to go to the LARP that's in their own country um, and feel like a bunch of rich foreigners are coming into their country and marginalising them. I would like to see large companies do more and do that better, but they are trying. Uh, no. uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that I actually experienced my first large this past weekend, but well, this week, 
I was in an improvisation course and we did like a mini LARP. I've done theater my whole life, acting and everything, but that was like completely new worlds and I, I find it like really, really like this imaginative, imaginative trip to my childhood that we did this, we built a character based like on our intuition and then we did this hot seat exercise where the whole crew asks us questions and then we build the character based on that. And it was a very beautiful experience and I was thinking just to ask like someone who has never done it before, what would you say that, uh, what is the benefit of blocking to your communication and to your mind and like that perspective if you could think. I, I saw the one minute board go up. <laughs> I think I need one hour to cover that. But um, I, I, as a, a veteran, obviously, I believe that this is the greatest hobby in the world. I, I think that this is a place where you, your social skills get better, your communication skills get better, your imagination gets better. You experience things you never thought you would be able to experience and you do it all in a massive group of like-minded and friendly and beautiful people who just want to make you have fun and it is really good fun I mean at the end of it all that it is, that even the most grim dark of games is about having fun uh, I, welcome <laughs> I hope you stick around I, I'm sorry, I think I've run out of time, um, but I am going to stick around for a little bit, probably in the bar. Um, so if anyone wants to come have a chat about anything that I said today, if you've got any more questions, things I didn't get to cover, uh, please feel free to come and talk to me now, or if you see me wandering around, I'm always happy to stop and talk love. Uh, I'm such a geek. Uh, thank you for listening, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your roundcast.